Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, here in Santa Clara, California, the day three of Cloud Expo Silicon Valley, our day three uh, journey through the enterprise aspects of the cloud continues. Now we want to introduce Windows as your, well, not introduced to the world, but introduced to this room. Who better do it but Mark Hinesbo? Do I say Hinesbo or Hinesbo? Mark Hinesbo is going to take it away on Azure and pass. Good luck, Mark. Thank you very much. And good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks a lot for uh, coming here. And I have been uh, excited uh, to be here, uh, you know, mostly because I get to trade cl cloudy Seattle weather with sunny uh, Santa Clara. Uh, but uh, more seriously, though, um, I work in our developer and platform evangelism, uh, part of Microsoft, uh, which means that we work with developers um, from the smallest one-person phone application uh, shop up to the largest enterprise. And over the last, you know, a year, year and a half, we've been really focused on cloud and what it means for the ecosystem. So I'm going to try and talk a little bit today, you know, a little bit of what cloud is. I know you've been through it, so I'll try to do that pretty quick, but there are some certain things I want to make sure that we have set the foundation for. A little bit of, of what Windows Azure is, but quite frankly, most about what are we seeing people use it for? Because I think that's what you want to see. Um, and that's what we've learned a lot over the last uh, year. So before I get started, though, I do want to steal a little bit of your time and do a shameless plug. One thing we do, you know, cloud might be the future of IT. Uh, you know, the next generation of students are the future for all of us in the industry that sit in this room. And we might just have talked about how can we optimize our IT resources to get it to 70, 80, 90% you know, utilization. Uh, there might even be outsourcing trends or whatever. The fact is, over the next three years, we'll have about a million IT jobs come up in the United States, of which we can fill half of them, about half a million with the people who graduate from universities. We have a huge, huge issue, if you want, as, as a country making sure we really energize a new generation uh, the way we got energized with what IT can do. We have a thing called Imagine Cup. It's coming out. It's, and it's, you know, think about it as the World Cup for programming. Uh, it's been around the world. We've held it under the pyramids in Egypt, under the Eiffel Tower in France, and next time it's going to be under the Statue of Liberty in New York. Um, so if you have any contacts in sort of the next generation, most of you are probably graduates of some college uh, or university, I'd urge you to go visit uh, imaginecup.us. Uh, you can get involved. You can help spread the word. Um, and let's see if we can't, um, interestingly enough, you know, not to talk politics, but there was just a White House science fair, um, and I think the president made a, an interesting comment and said, hey, if we do a, a football match, you, you know, and you win, you get invited to the White House, and, you know, in your local university, 15,000 people show up, right? When, 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 when is the last time 15,000 people have cheered for the local uh, college team that did something phenomenal? We're seeing students get you know, enormous things, both out, both out of the cloud and a lot of other things, and that's what this is about. So a little bit of a shameless plug, uh, but did want to take this opportunity to share some excitement with you uh, in another part of the business. So let's move on to the cloud. Um, you know, why all the fuss? Um, there's a lot of super interesting technology that goes into uh, the cloud. And, and I know what the previous speaker meant. I'll disagree a little bit. Virtualization is, if you want certainly one foundation enabling thing, you know, to the point I think he made more nuanced is it's not enough. Uh, but, but we are seeing uh, at internet scale, you know, new technologies enable brand new uh, uh, things if, if you want. One example that I'll give you is um, around our own mail systems. So when we run our own exchange servers and run in, in the old days, if you want, within Microsoft, we used, as I think most of you probably did as well, some nice SAN storage. You know, you have to have 24 by 7 management on it. Uh, if one of those expensive disks fail, you better, you know, uh, swap it quickly or you get a lot of annoyed users uh, on the other end. Contrast that to a product like Hotmail that runs on standard disks, same as you've got in your um, uh, laptops or, or desktops or whatever, radically different cost structure, but hey, they'll fail more often. But it's built on a massively geo-replicated scale where every storage is, is, is triple redundant. If a disk fails, we don't do 24-7 management. We do you know, eight hours a day, seven, five days a week management. Whenever the technician gets that disk the next time, it gets swapped. And in the meantime, the data has just failed over to some other place, and a third image is now spun up uh, some other place again automatically. 
Um, and that's sort of an example of where uh, some of the technologies come um, and how we're, we're building it across um, you know, various technologies and where you get some of the cost savings. But for all the wonderful technology, and this is just one, you know, one example today to, say, you know, to give you an, sort of an illustration of where we've come. Uh, today, when, when we ship servers into our data center, we ship them in containers of about 2,000 a pop. The container has three plugs, right? Cooling, power, Ethernet. Plugs in, you have 2,000 new servers. We don't touch that container at all until a certain percentage, you know, say 20% of the components have failed. When that's done, the container gets shipped back uh, to the manufacturer, refurbished, and comes into the data center. Right, and we ship hundreds of thousands of data centers per, er, servers per year into our data centers right now. So that's sort of how it's enabling uh, 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 things. Um, but, but all the fuss is not about the technology because, quite frankly, there's nothing you can do in the cloud that you couldn't do before. You know, no application really is, is that different uh, from moving to the cloud. The thing is all about cost. I'll talk a little bit more about that. It, it's the economic curve. And it's the ease with which you could do it. So I'll talk a little bit about the, the two other things. And I think our previous speaker also did a good job of saying, hey, it's, it's about the overhead you have. You know, some of the reduced management is about faster time to market. Um, I think we've all been where we want to provision some new service or, or the business is asking us to uh, capture a new business opportunity. And the answer back is, yes, we'll have your servers up and running uh, in about six months. We just have to make sure that it's you know, ready to f uh, uh, at the appropriate scale and reliability and so on, right? Um, in these massive data centers, you get that uh, a lot, lot quicker. Um, and you get, uh, I think the third one is one that we don't think much about. Um, I have one of my colleagues, uh, colleagues, Aaron Kelly, coming a little later, uh, talking uh, more about what we do uh, direct to end users. Uh, we have, we've moved our entire office franchise, if you want, up into the cloud. One of the, the issues we've had with our customers, if you want, is that they're two generations uh, behind. And the lens with which they might view IT is you know, office as it was 10 years ago and not as it is today. You know, by delivering both the client side and the back-end side, the server side, in the cloud, we can make sure that we can deliver the newest functionality to the user all the time. And, and that delivers end business value uh, almost instantly. Uh, but if I leave you with one sort of thought today, it's cost. So we did an extensive study based on what we've done, based on our own data centers. We've, you know, it, it took Microsoft about 10 years to get to the first thousand servers, you know, it took another five or ten to get to ten thousand, and now, as I said, we're shipping hundreds of thousands of servers into our new data centers every year. Uh, so we looked at ourselves, a lot of others, and the economics are stunning. If you're an average small and medium business, which means that your data center in this context is below a thousand servers, there's about a 25 times cost reduction of moving to the cloud. If you're a big enterprise, you know, on the other side of the 1,000 servers, and then, I mean, it is a linear scale, but sort of rough numbers, there's about an eight times cost advantage um, of moving to the cloud. Um, I have another colleague, uh, Tim O'Brien, who's going to come later today. He's going to go into a lot of detail in, of the cost, the business value drivers, and so on, not product-specific, but, uh, but sort of more macroeconomic uh, and macro-technical, if you want. So I'd encourage you to go to his uh, session. Uh, but, but just briefly, you know, on the supply side, there's some easy things. You know, of course, when you're buying 100,000 servers, you get them cheaper than when you buy 10. Right? Of course, you, we can put data centers where power is cheap. Uh, our new containers that are designed don't even need cooling. The airflow that naturally goes through very open constructions don't need cooling. So those are some of the advantages. Um, you can about, about half your cost just on the supply side by working on power management, overhead, and purchasing power. Some of the big stuff comes, though, when you start aggregating demand. And, and most of you are probably familiar with that. Take the example of, of our exchange server. During the working hours, at least, we have a very random pattern based on when people get in chat. And it's extremely hard to predict what the usage pattern is of back-end servers. But aggregate that over enough of different services, and it starts smoothing out. And you can get to some of that 90% utilization that you can't get on smaller populations. You have time of day. Our Bing servers that power search, right? They get hit by Japan at one time of day, by the United States at another time of day. 
Again, you can start smoothing those in, in the back end in the mega data centers. You have industry uh, seasonality like the holiday purchasing season where you have 50, 60 percent of purchasing happen in a very small time. All of those things you can start aggregating out in these big cloud data centers. And that's what gets you to uh, the 25 to 8 times cost reductions. And there are a lot of friction if you want to move to the cloud. We heard about some of it. There's regulation. There's security. Right? All the standard disciplines don't go away. But man, can you buy a lot of security and compliance for a 25% cost reduction. And I'd say we're seeing a lot of, lot of customers that initially were saying, hey, we're never going to move to the cloud because our healthcare workload can't run there. They're, they're, they've gone back, looked at sort of the contractual, if you want, or, and, and legal obligations, and are starting to come back based on, on pure economic pressure. And if anything, the, the recession we just went through really accelerated that. And it's extremely hard. So say that you can't get 8x cost savings, that the barriers you have to overcome eats half of it, or even, even three quarters of it. It's extremely hard not to justify 25 to 50% cost savings in running your back-end application infrastructure to your board of directors. So the, the pressures are enormous. The, the cost savings as we run this um, with, with our financial team at, at Microsoft are bigger than even we thought. And that's why you've heard us say sort of populistically, if you want, that we're all in. Um, we are leaning. We're moving rapidly our own servers uh, to the cloud. We're trying to do all that we can do to enable you uh, to get into the cloud um, as fast as possible. You've probably seen this before, but I do think it's useful thinking about different ways of the cloud. Right? The cloud is right now, like uh, who mentioned in the panel this morning, SOA, right? one of the most overloaded terms. And we're not always sure what we mean when we say cloud. Um, we at least think in, in sort of these three uh, boxes generically. Um, and the easiest way to differentiate them, I would say, is think about who the consumer of it is. When you think about infrastructure as a service, it is sort of what virtualization enables at the ground level. It's, it's advanced uh, hosting or advanced outsourcing in some cases, uh, the, you know, if, you, if you put it with someone else. The consumer of that is an IT professional. It's the people that run infrastructure, right? And they just got, if you want, a cheaper way of quickly provisioning that infrastructure. Um, platform as a service is more aimed at the developer. You, you go to the next level, if you want, of abstraction. It's all about running on, on your app, and you really don't care at all about the infrastructure. You assume that it's a black box that gets provisioned for you. Um, and then you have software as a service, uh, which is all about the end user, the, f the finished app. And, and if you want, the ultimate goal for most of us is to deliver our IT services in that fashion uh, so that we can auto-provision to our users. That is why, uh, in the example, and, and I, I would encourage you to go listen to Aaron uh, later today, uh, for instance, we're moving our office franchise into the cloud uh, so that end users don't have, you know, for, for you to provision a, a company in the future, especially in the small and, and, and uh, medium-sized space, but also in the enterprise space, you can go directly, and you don't have to have uh, that much of, of an IT infrastructure to get it. But those are sort of the three levels. What I'm going to talk about today, I'm not going to talk about the breadth. Um, again, if you want more detail on, on the three levels, um, uh, I'd encourage you to go talk or see Tim O'Brien's talk later today. But just to give you a little bit of a, the best way to think about the three is sort of what you have to manage in, in the different scenarios. If you go to the ultimate, right, if, if you think about today, you have to provision, you know, sort of classic client-server pre-virtualization. You're on point for everything, right? Uh, the network, the storage, the runtime, the data, the application, the entire stack. If you go all the way to getting your end software delivered as a service, you really aren't accountable for anything other than maybe monitoring uptime and SLAs and making sure that there are security policies and something like that. But it's the vendor you purchase that service of that's re you know, responsible for all the way from the networking stack all the way up, right? Infrastructure as a service is that first bridge on the way where you start utilizing uh, the virtualization uh, to get out of the server and, and storage management and, and just provision them one by one. But there's still a lot of stuff you have to do if you go to infra infrastructure as a service. You still have to provision those VMs, you know, per our previous speaker. You still have to figure out what happens if one fails. Where are you going to fail it over to? 
you know, how fast are you going to spin it up? How many instances are you going to spin up? How are you going to patch your VMs? All of that is still on you. In, in platform as a server, that's where all of that goes away. And what's up to you is write your application and get your application deployed. The, the entire fabric that it runs on will be auto-patched. If you say, hey, I need this much compute power, you don't need to worry about how many VMs or what happens if it fails or whatever. The underlying system takes care of it. And that's sort of the aim of my talk today, say that platform as a service, um, the applications you're going to build yourself, um, how are you going to do uh, with them? Some of the age-old uh, um, uh, trade-offs that we've been working as IT people do not go away. Right? If I think about software as a service versus platform as a server, it's back to the old, what do you build and what do you buy? Right? Platform as a service are for the applications you're going to uh, 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 build yourself. Either if you're an, you know, an end enterprise, it's because hopefully it gives you a unique competitive advantage that no package software package can give you, you know, the obvious way to build. Or it's because you're a software vendor yourself um, and you want to build that application and deliver it to your customer. Right? Versus the services that you think might be more commodity um, that you don't want to build yourself. That's why we've seen things like customer relationship management and move to the cloud rapidly as an end service. You know, a lot of companies are saying, hey, the way I manage my customer workflow is fairly standard across you know, salespeople in this uh, industry, in this industry, in this industry. Hence, I'm not going to build my own CRM system. I'm just going to consume it as an end service. Right? So that's sort of the differentiation between those two aspects of the cloud. So for those of us that love developing apps and uh, building apps, that's what Platform as a Service is about. It's about getting our app out the fastest we can get it uh, without having to waiting for servers being provisioned for us, without even having to worry about it. Um, it's about making sure that it can scale, uh, that it can meet all the demands we have uh, without us writing all that infrastructure plumbing and us focusing on the uh, business coding and, and business value of those applications. Right. So what, what's, what's Microsoft's offering uh, in the, the cloud? Well, we have, we have multiple. We, we do not, uh, even though we sort of say we're all in, you know, I, I don't believe that the industry, if ever, is going to shift 100% to the cloud. We still run mainframes today. Right? You can look at how technologies have come in. We almost always end up in hybrid scenarios. Uh, we've made existing investments. There might actually be apps that run diff you know, classes of apps uh, that run different in different um, uh, 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 environments. We also want to make sure that, that people have choice, right? um, that you can go and install and build your own internal cloud infrastructure uh, within your own data center, uh, and there are lots of use cases. Uh, there are certainly a lot of three-letter three acronym um, uh, public institutions that aren't ever going to put their stuff in a public cloud, irrespective almost of cost, chain, uh, of cost uh, savings. Right? They are going to run their own uh, private cloud, as are many enterprises, and there are many use cases. So we are building, um, if you want, on the right-hand side for you, uh, on our traditional Windows Server infrastructure, we're taking a lot of the learnings from our own public cloud and adding it to our, our um, products. Things like the app fabric we have, the thing that auto-provisions VMs, make sure what happens to storage when it fails over so you can just write your app. That is an example of a thing we've taken, if you want, from our cloud data center, from our Azure data center, and we're moving into Windows Server. So you can build, um, we have a thing, we have a whole architecture around our hypervisor um, and the app fabric and so on, so you can build your own cloud-based data center uh, in-house. In um, conversely, our, our, our key data centers are built on Windows Server and SQL Server and so on, and then adding uh, functionality, in some cases radically rewriting uh, functionality to work uh, at scale. And then in the middle, we're running right now what I'd call a pilot. It's still early days of can we deliver the equivalent of our own infrastructure to our customers. So you get that same server, and you plug in those three power, you know, uh, Ethernet and cooling, and you have your own instance of Azure running within uh, your own data center. Now, that, hap that turns out to be quite of an engineering challenge um, uh, because uh, what, you know, we, can, we, can, we can sort of control how we patch within our own data center. But what happens when that appliance runs within all of your data centers? What's the whole technology, policies, everything for rolling out patches? 
updating them. We have things like, uh, because Azure was built to run on thousands of servers, all that failover and so on intelligence we've built in assumed thousands of servers. So you can fail over on network nodes, you can fail over on storage, you can fail over on compute, you can fail over on everything, right? How do we deliver that in a smaller box? Because not everyone might want to buy it in boxes of 2,000s or 1,000s. Can we get that down to 100? We don't know, right? We're working on that. So we, have, we announced uh, a little while back that we're working with some of the, the big partners, both uh, enterprises and systems integrators, uh, to see what we can do sort of in, in that middle space. So you, you have the entire spectrum of saying, hey, what do you do with your existing infrastructure? Uh, what can you do when you can run on the cloud that we've invested in and run the applications in our data center? And can we find something in between that are you know, big boxes of compute power delivered uh, to you plug and play? But the whole premise uh, of it is that it runs on the same, from a developer point of view at least, the same set of tooling um, and, and programming languages and constructs. So if you're familiar with Visual Studio, if you're programming in .NET, it's fairly simple, and I'll, I'll give you a couple of examples of this later, to move your app from one of these sets. It, it should be, in the ultimate nirvana, it should be totally uh, friction-free for you to decide whether your app runs in Azure in a public cloud that we run, whether it runs in your internal data center, or whether it's a hosting partner uh, that has some specific industry capabilities or provides some certification to you that you want to run it with. Now, I'm not going to stay here today and say we're ultimately at that nirvana today. Today, there are small tweaks you, will, you have to do. They're not big, but they exist, right? It's not as easy as just, you know, writing the app and then geo-distributing it across, you know, your own data center, a partner's data center, not our data center. But we're getting close. And every sort of product iteration, and I'll show you some of that, will get closer and closer to that dream. So Windows Azure, what is it? Um, as, as sort of the ultimate, it's... Uh, it's uh, compute resources and storage resources. It's a SQL database in the cloud. And it's a set of, of connectivity uh, tools. So you can have security, access, uh, transacted uh, connections, and, and so on. Right? And it, sometimes, very simply, it's, it, it is relatively easy to explain. Uh, because all it is is you, you, know, you, you write your app, and then you go to Windows Azure, and you say, hey, how much compute power do you want this to do? What are the rules for scaling up and, and down? You know, when do you want to stop and cap stuff? Uh, you know, a relationship, relational database in the cloud is fairly easy to understand. And then all of us that have worked in uh, transacted systems, especially as you start doing cloud services that go across multiple systems, right? Some running in your own data center, uh, connecting to your supplier's CRM system or order management system or whatever. You need a set um, of capabilities to manage transactions, manage security, uh, access, validation, and so on. Um, and after that, it becomes tough, right? Because Azure is essentially a Windows Server and .NET in the cloud. And the same way that the operating system is, is multipurpose, right? You can say, what's Windows Server for? You know, everything from gaming to ERP systems to websites to everything in between. And, and, and this is the same, right? Uh, this is built as a multipurpose operating system in the cloud. Um, and it's built on that premise that you can deploy an app, and then you don't have to worry about the infrastructure once you've set, set the rules. So... That might leave you scratching your head and say, okay, you know, what do I then do with it if it's that general purpose? Um, and and um, I'll talk a little bit about that later. I just wanted to show you a little bit of the journey uh, so you also get an idea with, you know, of the sort of the speed. Uh, this is going to be a journey. It's going to be a multi-year journey. Uh, we started um, a couple of years back uh, when we had the first of what we call uh, CTPs. Uh, think about them as early technology, or if they are early technology previews. Uh, that, that we gave out at our professional developers conference. Um, and then we worked fast and furiously uh, towards February uh, of, uh, of 2010, where we went commercial with V1, if you want, on, on Azure. Um, along the way, a number of things happened. Like initially, we only had the compute power. And one of the biggest pieces of feedback uh, we got from a lot of the partners we worked with was, hey, it's good to have compute power and blob storage, but if you don't have a SQL database or a relational database of some kind, you know, there's a whole class of apps we can't build. You know? So that got accelerated on the roadmap, um, if you want, so that when we went commercial, that was also commercial in, in launch wave number one. 
Uh, since then, we've had a lot of experiences with the first uh, early adopters. And just last week, we had our professionals developer conference um, in, in Seattle. And we, we announced the next uh, slew of features. So we have a whole set of things uh, that we're filling out in the roadmap. I'm not going to go through all of them. This is more to give you an idea of, of how this is developing. But, but it's things uh, like we have a content distribution uh, network uh, for those classes of apps that need things like that. We announced a marketplace. So you can now trade data and apps. Um, and, and if you're in the business of, of either, right, you can put them in the cloud, but you can also sell them to your customers uh, in the cloud. We announced a virtual machine role, because there are some hybrid solutions where um, you might want to take some legacy code. You might want to fall back to something that's closer if you want. It's not really infrastructure as a service, but closer as you migrate apps up to ultimate platform as a service. Um, we announced an, what we call an extra small instance. Um, so we had sort of a standard and then a high power compute instance that you could dial up and down. And there, were, there was a class of workloads. If you look at our medium, it's about $0.08 cents an hour. So you can sort of calculate the minimum threshold of what that costs you per year to run, right? Um, so we, there was a class of apps that were smaller and didn't require that much that we wanted to enable. Um, and then we also announced what's uh, going to uh, come uh, moving forward. We're going to continue work, working on that VM roadmap. There's a set of enterprise class features uh, that will come in. We're working on putting the entire development lifecycle up in the cloud as well. So we have this thing called Team Foundation Server. That's your application lifecycle management server. Uh, today, most of our customers install it in-premise, right? And require, it it, it uh, does all their entire build, compile, test, and so on, uh, cycle of apps. That entire thing, we're moving to the cloud as well. So you can manage your software lifecycle end-to-end, you know, from initial program management and development all the way over to running your app at scale, uh, geo failed over on, on multi-continental data centers. So that's, that's the road ahead. It is going, going super, super fast. Uh, you can uh, go to uh, azure.com and find all the details um, here. I did want to spend a little more of my time rather than take you through all the technical detail and say, OK, given that it is general purpose, what, um, um, what are sort of the, the most of the usage scenarios we see? Um, and, and this is not meant to be complete, um, if you want. But there are a couple of scenarios that we see. Um, and I'll give you a couple of, of specific examples of each of them. One is what we call on and off. Um, you might have a batch workload, right? You might have um, uh, high performance computing needs where you need to spin up thousands of nodes to get a result back fast. And then once you're done, you take it down. And then you have all that capacity lying, right? And there's, that is an expensive proposition, uh, infrastructure wise. And there's a whole s class of apps um, at the ultimate end of scientific computing. Uh, you know, the, uh, the crash test models that automobile uh, manufacturers make. They've already invested in 10,000 node data centers to do it. But what if you are uh, just below that and your uh, company's not giving you permission to go out and buy a 1,000 uh, uh, node uh, data center that you have running? We're seeing a whole class of them come up uh, where people... Uh, spin up a workload and take it down, right? And sort of take advantage of the fact that a thousand processors for one hour now cost you the same as buying one processor, you know, for a thousand hours. Um, we see what we call both predictable and unpredictable bursting. Um, I talked about uh, the uh, the industry variability. Um, if you have a data center and then you know once a year because it's holiday season you double your traffic. Again, it's a it's an extremely expensive proposition to build two extra cap, you know, capacity to run it at 50% X most of the year. Um, so we're seeing a lot of people that run the base level in their own data center then fail over um, to the cloud when they need more uh, spikes. We see the growing fast, especially in startups, right? It's beautiful when you can write a new app and you have nothing, you know, sort of no legacy uh, to worry about. It's the absolutely the sweet spot for moving to the cloud. You, you can design, build the, the app uh, to be multi-tenant and things like that from the beginning. Um, and when you have huge variability, I don't know what my growth is, right? Is it going to be 2x? You know, I hope it's going to be 10x. Um, if my uh, business plan that the investor holds, it's going to be 20x, right? But how do I provision for that variety of span? We're seeing a lot of that. And it's not just startups, right? Uh, within enterprises, divisions that aren't sure. Is this product going to take off, right? What happens if it, if it spikes? Even uh, social marketing and viral marketing, it, it's, it is sort of, even for the best marketeers, hit and miss. 
whether a campaign goes viral. But if it goes viral, you better want to be able to fulfill that demand, right? And, and not have 10 people watch your video, but have, a, have 10 million watch your, your video uh, and not be capped uh, by that. Um, and then the last scenario that we're also seeing is, um, I, I didn't really know what name to put on it, uh, but sort of business critical uh, line of business versus mission critical. Um, so a lot of times our core infrastructure for our most mission critical app is well taken care of. But the business has a lot of wishes uh, that sort of come as, call them tier two or whatever. Super important, capture a new business opportunity, uh, support a workflow or whatever, that get queued up. And I don't know how many of you have a backlog of, hey, I wish I could fulfill this wish list, uh, right? But I have to prioritize and only the first two will happen. Um, and then the business gets frustrated because there's a number of things they can't take advantage of. And we're seeing people move whole portfolios of them to get faster to market. Test them out, kill them if they don't work, you know, scale them if they do work. Um, so let me give you just a couple of examples of that. I, I do think um, case stories help a lot. In sort of that on and off, right, the, the supercomputing. Um, we worked with Pixar's Renderman. Um, most of you probably know what it does. It's the industry-leading industry leading solu solution for computer graphic uh, animations. And it's used in things like, you know, uh, Toy Story and so on that we all take our kids and secretly, you know, are glad that we have kids because it gives us an excuse uh, to go watch it. But it's used across multiple industries, right? It's also in commercials, uh, in, uh, in uh, regular TV shows where you want some animation happening or popping up, right? Um, and, and if you look at sort of the example, which I think is brilliant, right? Toy Story has 290,000 frames, uh, and it takes eight hours of one processor core to render one frame. So that means that if you only had one computer, it would take you 272 years to render uh, Toy Story, which obviously you can't wait for. Um, and when you are doing Toy Story, right, as I said, those people have already invested in a massive render farm. But a lot of the smaller agencies, a lot of smaller studios might not have. So how could Pixar scale out to that customer audience and sell their app? Well, they moved it up to the cloud and used the fact that you can dial that up and down as you want to, right? So when the small studio is, is doing a commercial and they want to render it, they just put it on 100 cores for an hour, get the results back, and, and take it down, uh, running on Azure. Um, that was an old, if you want, not old, uh, but it was, it's a C++. Uh, app, right? It's built for high performance, high number crunching. Uh, absolutely sort of the right choice at the time to build it in, in C++. Uh, but they were able to take the advantages of the technologies we have, move that app up. Uh, it, it took some work, right? We, we worked with them for a while, uh, but, but uh, less than you'd think. Um, and now they have it up and running, right? And it runs dynamically. It's a beautiful, if you, you know, unfortunately I couldn't demo it here, but um, as it runs in the cloud, the, the studios get it frame by frame. So as each frame renders, they can see the results. That means that they can stop it you know, midway if it's not rendering the way they want to or whatever. So it's truly sort of interactive in the cloud. But that, that has applicability across a ton of scenarios. It's not just the gaming um, and graphical industry. It's almost all computes intensive uh, scenarios. It could be a Wall Street where you want to crunch models. It can be your own customer relationship data uh, where you have uh, terabytes of data that you need to crunch. And then you need to get smart. You know, one of the things that Picture, uh, that Picture does well in their application as well is as you do new render passes, it checks what's already been uploaded. I mean, you can sort of imagine the imagery you have to upload to the cloud to get some of these things rendered. You don't want to upload gigabytes of data every single time you do sort of a remake. So it auto does an auto diff test and only uh, loads changes in assets and so on uh, up into the cloud. I think that's sort of an excellent scenario of, um, and the cost savings and the ability to open up you know, whole new market segments for them um, is some of the power of the cloud. If you think about um, unexpected spikes, uh, we work with, with Kelly Blue Book. Um, um, some of you might remember Cash for Clunkers. Um, and and when, as that program was being rolled out, they got some pretty big spikes uh, a actually, people wanting to know how little their car was worth, you know, whether they could get cash for it instead of how much. Um, they had an existing data center, um, you know, sort of ran well for their core, but these spikes were, cre you know, creating all sorts of havoc. This is an uh, ASP.NET C Sharp, you know, .NET app. It took less than one percent change, less than one percent change of the code to move it into the cloud, and they now fail over seamlessly. 
you know, as the end user, you, do, you don't know. Most likely when you hit it, it's running on their own data center because that's where the base load is running. Uh, but as soon as it spikes, they fail over. Um, and that saved them, you know, at least, and this is sort of conservative, but at least $100,000 uh, for them not having to add that extra capacity uh, to handle in their own data centers. And that we're seeing a lot of, right? Um, I should, by the way, and I forgot to say that when I was talking about Azure, Azure is not just for .NET development. Um, we have, we have, we, you know, we live in a heterogeneous world. We're going to continue doing so. Um, we have built uh, Java runtime, PHP runtime. Uh, we're committed to make them first-class citizens uh, on, on the platform uh, so that you can run applications written in PHP or Java uh, on Azure as well. Um, and we've been working with a lot of different frameworks to make sure we, I mean, we have WordPress and, and, and things like that running uh, with, with Tomcat and MySQL and so on uh, underneath. So we're working through that. We have plugins to uh, Eclipse and, and so on. So you can work in those development environments and have a heterogeneous uh, uh, development stack. Um, but clearly, some of the early adopters will have been the customers we work with for, for a while. Um, in this case, you know, Kelly Blue Book. Um, another example of, of the growing fast um, and the spiking is uh, Envoy's Pay. Uh, they are a payment processing uh, vendor. Uh, their core proposition, if you want, is uh, they integrate. This is an example with, with car dealers. They integrate an ADP, which is the you know, leading uh, um, solution, CRM, ERP, if you want, solution for, uh, for, the, for the dealerships. Uh, they integrate and they process uh, the payment. Um, and they are able to take, uh, they, you know, uh, they are, they have one of these scenarios where they sort of know that they're going to grow at least 5x uh, over the next year, depend, you know, depending on, on their pent up customer demand and their pipeline, and it could be as much as 20x. So, so what do you do, right? Do you go build a data center for 20x, uh, or do you go into the cloud and, and enable that scale up scenarios? And that's what they've, they've done. Um, and that, combined with sort of their overall solution, allows their average customer and dealership in this segment, uh, depending on size of your dealership, to, to save everything from uh, 25000 to 250000 What they've taken is the average processing before cost about $3 per, pay, per invoice processing uh, in the old system, and they've taken that down to um, about the cost of a postage stamp, so you know, uh, um, less than a dollar um, uh, by both building their solution and then enabling the, the cloud to scale it for them. Uh, but that's a great example. They are going to run uh, you know, at least 50,000 concurrent uh, connections, possibly a lot more, uh, um, uh, through uh, the Azure cloud over the next year uh, in their payment transaction. And then, you know, as I, I said you know, last, uh, the line of business apps that are queued up. Um, we have a, a number of, of, of examples of, of them. You know, I'll choose a couple. We had Coca-Cola. Uh, they were looking at an application to um, a lot of their uh, smaller dealers, so not the, the Coke that they sell to uh, the Walmarts and the Costcos, but to small restaurants, to um, convenience stores, to gas uh, stations, and so on. Uh, that was a combination of fax and phone, um, right? Whereas if you think about the, the, their big customers were, had full sort of EDI uh, integration, everything in their ERP systems. So they wanted to build a new solution. Again, this is extremely spiky. Uh, you know, we, we buy our um, soft drinks you know, a lot based on how hot it is or whether there's a Super Bowl finals or whatever. Um, and that was one of their reasons uh, to move into the cloud. Plus, it is business critical. Right? You don't want to have this set of customers uh, not be fulfilled. Uh, the amount of complaints you're going to take is going to be uh, pretty quick, pretty rapid. So it is business critical uh, for them. Uh, yet they were facing that, hey, how fast can we roll it out? How fast can we get it through all our internal infrastructure requirements? Um, so they put that on Azure. They're up and running um, and have about $50 million of, uh, per day in orders placed on the system today, as you can read. Uh, internally, we're doing the same thing. Uh, you can argue that Microsoft is a, um, is, a, is a weird place to be. Our IT department has a mandate to be an early adopter and to dog food uh, our stuff. And, and that pushes them sometimes in a little bit in, in unnatural uh, ways, but it's sort of a benefit for all, you, all of you uh, because we get it tested early. 
Um, and we've moved a, a number of applications, both uh, internal, smaller line of business apps. Um, one of the biggest apps we, we've uh, moved over just recently is Channel 9. It's, it's a developer uh, end destination. Think of it as s sort of the handheld camera that runs around Redmond campus and interviews what's going on behind the scenes. Um, in terms of our product development, uh, we have, um, I'm trying to think if I can remember the last statistics, but we have something like 2 million unique users per month at least. It might even be 4. Uh, by now, it's been, been a little while since I looked at the statistics. So it gives you an idea of the scale of the web property. Um, it's a lot of video that gets delivered through it, and we've taken advantage of some of those uh, content delivery network. You know, it's, it's rapidly evolving. It's a very social uh, network site. Uh, so, all, you know, as soon as new stuff happens uh, in terms of Twitter integration, Facebook integration, Foursquare, you name it, they need to roll that in. Um, and this has really helped them get into the, both that sort of scaling and get into the rapid um, application uh, cycle uh, on it. So those are just a couple of examples. Um, and that is one of the things I expect most likely to grow the fastest uh, over this next time of, of or, or sort of next uh, uh, 12 months or so, right? Because the the technology is now so stable and proving out that you have no issues moving your core line of business. And, and a lot of them might be things you haven't made investments in already. So um, I hope that gave you a reasonably good uh, overview. It's hard to cover everything uh, that's going on. And this was only the platform as a service sliver. Uh, today, we have 10,000 customers uh, running uh, in Windows Azure uh, on the cloud. We launched, um, as I said, February uh, of, of this fiscal year. Uh, so it gives you an idea of how rapidly it's growing. It is all over the place. It's from the biggest uh, household names to the smallest startup uh, that's running on, on the infrastructure today. If you want to learn more, the, the most uh, uh, or the easiest way uh, would be to go to azure.com. It's your one-stop resource. Um, if one thing to, to uh, take a look at, if uh, you yourself or your developers are already uh, have an MSDN subscription, so a Microsoft uh, Developer Network subscription and Visual Studio tools, you get a set of free hours in the cloud as part of that. So for them to get their first experience, you know, get up in the cloud, build the first app and run, that's all included in your, in your MSDN subscription uh, already. So uh, for those that have that, I'd encourage your developers to just go up um, and have that first test with it and figure out what will work and what won't in, in your infrastructure. So with that, uh, I just want to say a, a big thanks uh, to you for, for listening. As I said, we have my colleague Tim O'Brien talking more about the macro level, uh, both technical and economics, in a session later today. Uh, we have uh, Aaron Kelly talking more about end software as a service and specifically how we've taken our office franchise into the cloud uh, tomorrow. So if you want to hear more about sort of Microsoft and how we're going uh, forward, those are two great sessions to uh, visit. But um, thank you very much, and have a great day. Thank you. Thanks to Tim Hinsborough, and thank you, Microsoft, for getting Azure onto the map.